godparents on this side, please. Parents right over here. It's good to see you, brother. Good to see you. How are you? Face that way. There you go. Just, yes, that's it. Hey, Melissa, stand over here. I won't bite you. Face them. Hey, listen. Uh, if you've never been to a dedication here, many people in religion, you know, uh, down the ages, they sprinkle babies. They put oil on them. They put powder on them. They, they put dust on them. They, they do all kinds of things. And what they do is that they seem to think that by doing that, that all original sin is gone and the child is clear for takeoff with Jesus, you know. And, and, uh, and really, whenever babies are dedicated, what, what usually happens is they come to church. All your friends come to church. Then they go someplace and they get drunk afterwards. Am I right or wrong? You know, and, and that's not much of a dedication, is it? And so something that we love doing is, is that when we dedicate a child, we like to be able to charge the parents and the godparents. I want to read a scripture to you. It's one that I never really usually read for this, but one that's dear to my heart because I think it shares the spirit and the responsibility of what being a godparent is. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2 says this, and the things that you have heard me saying in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men and women who shall be able to teach others also. So today as we stand here with you and the family, there's going to be times when Melissa's not going to agree with you guys. You know, there's going to be a time when you forget a birthday and maybe she'll get mad, maybe not. She's a good girl. I don't think she's that way, but... Many godparents I see, they, they, they lose their friendship over the smallest thing. And I want you to know that what's important here is your friendship. And through that friendship, she's giving you some responsibility over her child, over her son. And this is a great thing. It means it's not for one week, one year, one birthday, one Christmas, but forever. Am I correct? Forever. So she wants you to be her friend forever. Not a social friend, but an intimate friend. One that cares about her baby. And one of the things I have to charge you with as pastor is, I want to see this baby at church. I want to see this baby grow up in the fear and the love of the Lord. I want to see this baby here and see good things in his home and in his house. And so you now have part of that responsibility. Something were ever to happen to Melissa and she strays away, it's your job to bring her back. Say, hey, that baby needs to be in the house of the Lord, and so do you. That's where we met. That's where we dedicated him. So today, in the presence of all these witnesses, if that doesn't make you nervous enough, in the presence of your, of, of your good friend and in the presence of a minister, do you take full responsibility for making sure that your friendship stays safe and secure so that you can be good godparents to this child? If you do, would you please say, we will? Thank you. Melissa, raising a child, a single mom, a great challenge. Fathers sometimes are non-resident, few and or missing in action. It's a tough thing. I know it's hard. See the tears sometimes. See you crying alone. See you praying alone. See you waiting patiently. I want to give you uh, two words of encouragement. Number one is, is that uh, God will take care of your loneliness. And he will bring you not, not just amen, amen. Not just a man. You see, but the key here is the right man. The right man. And my prayer for you today is, is that you would wait. Wait. And with your family, bring him to us. We won't be too rough on him, but we'll check him out for you. Because he's going to have to be a man that will love them and love you. Sometimes men want to love you but not your children. And, and it is important that they love your babies as well. And, and so our prayer for you is that you would wait on the Lord. God's word says he knows every hair on your head, everything, even the words on your, on your mind. He says even before one reaches your lips, your father knows them all full well. Everything. There's no place you can go. No place you can hide. He knows everything about you. Every intimate detail you'd never tell your best friends, God knows them already. So you today, will you promise in the presence of all these witnesses of God and of me as a servant of the Lord to honor these godparents, to let them do their job of, of, of helping you raise that child, 
and now also of caring for this child. This child, when you bring him to the Lord now, you're dedicating, saying, Lord, this child is yours. Here's Nene. Take him back. And God says, thank you. And he blesses him. And then he says, now here, he's for you. Now you raise him in the fear and in the love of the Lord. Never let him be a stranger to this house. You may not even agree with me someday. Get mad at the pastor. Bring your child to the house of the Lord and come yourself. Someone in the church may hurt your feelings. Something may happen and you'll want to leave. Don't ever let another person keep you from keeping your relationship with God. So now, Melissa. Let me hold a minute. I want all the ushers and deacons to wear these little outfits like this. Father in heaven, Lord, I can hear a little heartbeat. I dedicate this child to you. Safety, compassion. Help him grow to be a young child, then a boy, then a young man than a man of love, of service, caring, loving, peace, intelligent, bright, wonderful man of God. We ask that now, Father. You pray your hedge of protection around him, Father. May you encamp your angels around him always. Raise him in your fear and in your love. And Father, now we just dedicate him. But one day he'll have the opportunity to say, I do to you. Say, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. So for now, now we place him back in the hands of his mother for her to bring him to the house of the Lord and teach him about you. We dedicate him in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we come before you. We dedicate this family to you. We pray your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead and take a picture. What? Hey, listen, at this time, I'd like to dismiss all, the, uh, all of our children's church, ages 4 through 11. Thank you for giving them a hand. Here you go. This is for your baby dedications. Hallelujah. Are you excited about the Lord? Adewali. I wonder if you'd stand and ask God's blessing on the word. Just stand and ask God's blessing on the preaching of the word today.
I'll give you a microphone next time. Thank you. This, by the way, who crawled up here by himself is my grandson. Give me a kiss. I guess now is not a good time to say, parents, if you have a child that disrupts the service and walks up, <laughs> God's got a way of humbling us, doesn't he? Man. Hey, listen, is this a cool jacket? Good, good. You saw it. Take a picture and because it's too hot in here. Hey, I want you to turn in your Bibles or, or look on the screen behind me to the book of Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. My message will not be long today, but hopefully it will be powerful. Amen? Joshua chapter 7. I want to give you some context or some background first. If you know anything about the book of Joshua, in chapter 6, they went to a place called Jericho. And at Jericho, God told them to march around, blow the trumpets, crack the, the uh, thing, put their torches up, and they were going to have victory. And how many of you know that they had victory? They took over. Jericho was a big place. It said, a fortified city. <laughs> and yet, they took that place down like that. Well, what happens? Then they come to the next place in the Word of God, and it's found in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, in verse 1 is where it starts. They came to a place called Ai, A-I, place called Ai. Right after Jericho was this place called Ai. It was, the, it was the home of the Amorites, which was a great enemy of the people of God. Are you with me? You can say amen or me or my if you're Puerto Rican, say ouch or oi. It don't matter. But my point is, is, is that they then come to this place called I. And in this place called I, they, they had a great defeat. I want to read it to you now. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, here we go, this little town, which is near Bethaven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied Ai. When they returned to Joshua, now here's the spies, they said, not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. Basically, what they were doing was saying, ah, it's no big thing. We can, we can knock it out. We don't need to send a whole army. Just send a couple thousand men. We'll knock it out. You follow me? The pride of man sets in, doesn't it? What verse are we at? Four. Thank you. Okay, good. Glad you're watching. So about 3,000 men went up, but, when, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck, down, and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Remaining there till evening, the elders, of the, the elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? He's telling him, Get up. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They have, violate, they have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them in their own possessions. That, that is why Israel cannot stand up against their enemies. Key verse. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. 
Then he tells him, go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. That which is devoted is among you. O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come, come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. God is going to find out who's been doing wrong. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward, tri Israel forward by tribes, and Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward, and he took Zerites. He had the clan of the Zerites come forward by families, and Zimri was taken. Joshua had his family come forward man by man and Achan son of Camry son of Zimri son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken what a list of family names there then Joshua said to Achan 19 20 and 21 I want you to pay close attention then Joshua said to Achan Achan by the way Achan is a word that in the Hebrew means trouble means trouble okay then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him praise. Tell me, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Achan replied. Here we go. You ready? 20 and 21. And keep them on the screen for me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder... A beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Let me talk to you. A wedge. I took my mountain bike for a ride over on Sand Island, and, and they have a a railroad track it's kind of a little docking station back there they have all the trains there they just kind of sit there it's a flat level grand and they sit them there about four years ago I asked one of the guys that works over there how they make sure they don't roll down or anything he said very simple when a train is stopped it's not hard to keep it from moving he said you just take a little he says in this bag I carry a bunch of little blocks of oak and they're just little wedges I stick it in front of the tire one in front of the other tire it can't move it can't be pushed, nothing. It's just not going to go anywhere. And I began to think about that, about how can you hold something so powerful back with something so small? Something almost so insignificant, just a little wedge. And I began to think about our lives. Because, because if a train is in full motion, you can't stop it with a concrete wall. But ask yourself today, is there a wedge in my life? Have you been getting cold lately? Have you been losing your fire for the Lord? Have you been not praying as much as you used to? Not seeking God as much as you used to? Not worshiping God the way that you used to? Did you, when you started out in this game we call Christianity, were you on fire for God? The weight of the world left you. Your addiction is gone. But, but now you find that you're not growing anymore. You're still a weakening in Christ. Everything is always someone else's fault. You know, there could be a wedge in your life stopping you. This is what happened. Did you know that in the book of Joshua, there's only one defeat. They never lost another battle. They never, ever, ever lost one more battle. It's the one and only battle. And it was with their smallest, almost most insignificant enemy. The one they thought they could do like that is the one that caught them a wilder. The one they thought would never pose a problem was the one that defeated them. So I want to talk to you today because when I read this over, and many of you, I told you to read it all week, and tonight I'll give you another. By the way, tonight's going to be a slamming message on how do you receive, and that's all I'll tell you. But I just wanted to tease you because I thought, Lord, if you could show me what sin he committed, I'll tell my people and they'll be free. 
And so I kept looking. I, it's the gold. He stole the gold, stole the silver. That's what it was he stole, right? And I kept thinking, is that it? The Lord said, nah, search a little, read a little more. Read a little more. So I want to show you the progressive steps, if you will. The steps towards having your life halt. Are you with me? The steps, the progressive steps towards having your life be halted. Number one, if you just take me to verse 20 and 21. He says, this is what I have done. Now watch, I want you to take me to 21 and leave it right on the board. One verse. Are you with me? Come on, are you falling asleep? Everybody have coffee? Okay, good. Are you with me? The first thing. There are four things, four steps, because I thought it was one sin. He stole something, but that's not it. There are four things that led him, and maybe four things that you can look at in your life and see if maybe there's a wedge that's slowing you down and stopping you. You used to be on fire and find you're, 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 you're not on fire at all. you you more like your wood is wet. You ain't got no fire. Are you with me? You don't mind me saying ain't, right? If you don't like that, just keep it to yourself. And, and anyway, my, my, my point being this. Look at verse 21. The first step towards being stopped, the first step that puts a wedge in your life and stops your spiritual walk is what I call a gaze. The gaze. The look of the eyes. Look at this text. He says, when I saw the plunder, the beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. The first thing I just want you to, if you have your Bible circle, when, when I saw, when I saw, anybody follow me? When I saw. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with seeing things. I mean, if you can imagine Achan, Achan had a sword out and they were down there and they were cutting people up, taking stuff away. And sometimes you in your life, you can't block every curse word that you hear on your job. Come on now, right or wrong? Sometimes we get exposed to stuff. But this time it was just something was in him. The devil was in the game trying to get him to look. You see, looking's not a problem. It's when you gaze. And that word there that says, I saw means that he gazed upon it. Not that he just looked, but he kept on looking. Anybody follow me? He, he kept on looking. And it was that gaze. It was that lust of the eyes was the first thing, was that first step towards falling or that first step towards defeat. Do you follow me? Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. It says, and, and God told Eve and said, do not eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? He, he tells her, don't eat of this tree. And she goes up there and says, and she looked upon it. And she looked upon it. Then, then she looked upon it and, and she saw. And there's the word again. And she saw that it was desirable. She saw that it was pleasing. She saw that it could fulfill her appetite. Are you following me? You see, looking's not the problem. It's when you begin to gaze at something with an unholy appetite. Can you say amen? It's not looking. It's when you begin to get that unholy appetite. Think about David. David is supposed to be out fighting the enemy. And he's out there, it says, And in the evening, King David took a walk on his roof. And when he was out on his roof, he looked over at another roof. And there he saw a woman, Bathsheba. Ain't nothing wrong with seeing a woman Bathsheba. But if you read in, in Samuel, it says, and then he saw. There's the word again. You see, he saw. There's that unholy look that says, he saw that she was desirable. He saw that she was a beautiful. He saw that she was a woman that he wanted to have. And there it is, the gaze. What you been looking at a little too long, folks? Folks, there's nothing wrong with seeing a beautiful woman. There's nothing wrong with seeing a handsome man. You'd be an idiot if you try to act like you don't see it. You're blind. We'll think you're funny. But the point is sometimes you can look upon something. And then you can look upon it with that unholy gaze. Anybody follow me? And you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself when you see that you've got that unholy gaze and you're looking at something a little bit too long because most adultery doesn't. I don't know what happened, Pastor Jim. I was in bed with her. Really? I bet you it started with a look. I bet you it started with a little look, a little bit of what we call pre-adultery. You know, that extended gaze where your mind starts to run and you begin to imagine. 
You follow me? Why, why are you so quiet today? You think I'm beating you up or something? I mean, what's stopping you in your life? What's, what, what have you been looking at? That's been the wedge that froze your walk. You're so quiet today. You with me? See, it wasn't about a wedge of gold. But then what was the next thing? Are you follow me? And the very next verse, it shows you. Number one was, was his gaze or the look of the eyes. Number two was his greed or the lust of the heart. His greed. And look at this. Same verse, one verse. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. And look at the next word. He says, I coveted them. Come on, circle that. He says, I, look, he says, I coveted them. I coveted them. Most people don't even know what coveted means. To covet something, listen to me, to covet something means that you have a strong, inappropriate desire for something that does not belong to you. You follow me? I didn't say you can't have an education. I just can't lust after yours. I don't care if you want to have a nice car. I just can't be jealous because you got one. I don't care if you got a nice house. I just can't be jealous because you got one. And, and, and man, I mean, as hard as I work, you look like you don't deserve it. And I deserve that. Are you following me? You see, so the next thing he does, he says, he says, and I coveted them. I coveted them. He said, I wanted that. But God said in chapter 6, he says, these things were devoted to me. I told you to destroy that. I didn't tell you to take that home. I didn't tell you to hide that. And what I'm talking about here is not about silver, gold, or no designer Babylonian robe. I'm talking about maybe some past stuff in your life that you've been bringing into your life right now. And it's stopping you. It's become a wedge. He says, I coveted them. I wanted something that was not mine. How many of you have done that? Uh, you, you, know, you, know, you know, I'm not happy with my woman. I need that woman. I'm not happy with this. I need that man. I'm not happy with this. I need that one. And we're always looking at something that belongs to another. Somebody say, amen, oh me, oh my, out, something. You know we do it. Why can't my husband be like that? Why can't my wife be like her? Why can't my kids be like this? Why can't my, we always, and you want to know what covetousness is really grounded in? It's grounded, here, here it is, free. It's grounded in the fact that we are not grateful for what God has already given us. You only covet when you have not been thankful for what you already got. And so you're busy looking at what others have. But this was the second thing he says, and, and listen to me, when, weighing 50 shekels, and he says, when I saw them, he said, I coveted them. You see, the second step, if the first one is the gaze of the eyes, the second one is the greed, is the lust of the heart. Man, it'd be nice to own that. I'd like to have that. Are you following me? But still, you're okay. I mean, even if you make it that far, you, you can still bail. You really can until number three comes along. You ready? Same verse. When I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw the plunder. A beautiful robe designer, Pierre Cardin from Babylon. 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. Number three. If number one is the gaze, number two is the greed, then number three is the grasp. You follow me? Then I took them. What does the grasp have to do with it? I took shows us our will. When what we see and what we've coveted, we begin to, to walk into what we feel like and we begin to take something that's not ours. Are you following me? Adam and Eve did the same, Eve did the same thing. Said, she, saw the, she saw the fruit that it was desirable. She, she gazed upon that fruit that it was desirable. She, she looked and thought it would be pleasing to the eye and appetizing for the belly. And so she gazed on it, and before you know it, she had it in her hand. Are you following me? 
King David did the same thing. It says he was out on his roof one night and it says he saw beautiful Bathsheba. He, he saw her and then he took it to his he, he saw that she was beautiful to gaze upon. He saw that she was a beautiful woman and he looked and that gaze turned into covetousness and then he said, soldier, go get me that woman. Bring her back to me. And he took her. Are you following me? What have you been gazing at too long? What have you been pondering in your heart? Do you know that if you always are lusting after somebody else's man, woman, child, even position, it's that you're not satisfied with what God has already given you. Come on, somebody, say amen to that. How many of you know that we sometimes are just not satisfied? Hey, listen to me, I'm not happy with what I got. I want what you have. I want a bigger degree. I want a bigger, listen, I mean, listen, I want a bigger title. I want more juice. I want a pastor's door. I want a bigger church. I want the biggest church. Why aren't you happy with what I gave you? Why aren't you content with what I gave you? Why haven't you learned to thank me and give praise for, for what I've already put in your hand? I set you free. I saved you. I delivered you. I healed your body. I healed your mind. Why haven't you given thanks for what I already gave? You're already looking for something else. Unsatisfied brat. Anybody with me? His grass. Eve, she saw it. She wanted it. She took it. David, he saw it. He wanted it. He took it. And they all ended up in sin. It stopped their walk in God, didn't it? Eve got cast out of the garden with Adam. And David lost his son, died. Lost a whole lot of credibility in the kingdom. Are you with me? Number four. Final point. You ready? If number one is the gaze. The look. Number two is the greed. It's a heart thing. Number three is what? The grasp. It's the consent of the will. I want this. I'm ready to take it now. Then number four is the guilt. This is where many of us are today. We've been stopped in our tracks. With just a little wedge, something very insignificant. Let me run this by you, see if you get it. It says in 21, When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them in my heart, and then I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent they are hidden the fourth one is the guilt I believe that's what's stopping the church from having a revival and tonight we're going to have church folks if you don't come tonight we'll see you next Sunday but you missed it tonight number four is the guilt well, let, 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 let's just run by it a little bit if I have this beautiful you know Versace coat from Babylonia that I stole. I'd want to wear it in front of you folks. But wouldn't I? I want you to see my new coat. Why would I have to bury it? Because I know what I did, right? Now if I got all this shekels, all this, all this money, all this silver, why, why, why ain't I spending some? I mean, why can't I buy a new house or buy a new chariot or a new camel, I guess, back then or something, you know? Why, why, why can't I? Because I know what I've done. I mean, if I have a, a, a silver wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I mean, why can't I show it to you and polish it in front of you and let you see it? Because I know I've done something wrong. Are you follow me? So what is it that stops you? And, and this is the sweetest thing. They are hidden in the ground, in the ground, meaning something deep and then inside my tent. Look, I, I, I know I'm going to break some, hum, I'm, I won't even say the word, uh, hermeneutical rules for the theologians in the house. But tent, to me, always indicates that I am the temple of God. I am the tent of God. So, so, so there were some things from my last battle in Jericho that God told me not to bring into this battle anybody follow me yet 
Let me bring you home. Come on now. I'm just trying to bring you home. So there's some things I've done in my past. Some battles that have already been done. Some guilt and shame that's already gone. Some things that were supposed to be destroyed. And I brought them into my life now with me. Could that be the guilt that's stopping many of us from growing in the Lord? Oh, when you got off that addiction or from that thing or that marriage is squared away, you got that job or that healing came, that disease is gone. And you were happy. You born again experience. You saved and all this and that. You religious. And, and man, you were just on fire for God. But lately you've been slow. Like a train has been chocked with a little wedge and you don't move. You just attend. But you have no more forward motion. And could it be that, that you began to gaze on something from a past battle? Could it be that, that there was greed in your heart for that, that one little sin? Oh, Pastor Jim, I let this go. I let the heroin. I let the crack. I let the adultery. I let this. But, 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 but don't, mess with my, don't mess with my magazine collection. I got to keep this with me. Oh, just, just I, I'm being a good father now, but but don't 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 tell me I got to get rid of my porno site and put my put my computer in the living room where everybody can see what I'm looking at. Uh, Pastor Jim, I'm not drinking anymore, and I'm not hanging at the go-go bars. I, I but but just uh, uh, don't tell me I can't have a little case of beer in my refrigerator. Pastor Jim, I don't get high with my friends no more. I just, I just smoke a little pot at home. Pastor Jim, I stopped cheating with that woman. My stuff is right. My house is in order. I, 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 I do watch a little porno now and again, though. But, 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 that's, but I'm faithful to my wife. Ooh, man. You see, sometimes it's that little thing. The little fox that spoils the vine, that creates the wedge in your life, that stops the train from forward motion, that stops you from being everything God called you to be. Now, I didn't want to lay a heavy message, but last week I, I, I lifted you up and I was very encouraging. And, and I knew that this week I was going to try to slam dunk some of you. But we're not going to have a revival as such. If you just want to have church, there's a bunch in the valley. Go to one. We'll drive you if, if you just want to attend. But if you want to grow, if you want to be empowered, if you want to change, if you want to not be stagnant, and, and listen, that smell that you smell is still water. And God's Word says there'll be a fountain flowing from within us. Something fresh and something new. It's time to change the earth and find out what's the wedge that's stopping my walk. What's the way when I had my victory at Jericho, when I had my victory in my life, when I had my victory when I was set free, why don't I have victories now? What has been stopping me? Is it your gaze? Is it your greed? Your lust of the heart for things that don't belong to you? Hmm. I wonder. He said, I placed them inside my tent. Home Depot, a wedge. You know, sometimes, how many of you know sometimes uh, people live in denial, and, and, and denial is not a river in Egypt. De- denial. Denial. Sometimes we got issues in our life, and we just refuse to admit something's wrong. I've done that. Anybody else ever done that? You know, sometimes there's a wedge in your life, and you don't even know it, right? Come on now, right? Sometimes there's a way. But here's the bummer about this. And this is why I'm presenting this message. It's, it's, it's a very selfish message. I confess to you it's very selfish because, because you see, you see what happened to these people and I, if you read chapter 7, was that, uh, was that all of them were set running. 36 of them were casualties and everything stopped because a few people were sinning and had wedges in their life. And so God calls them to the task. He tells Joshua, what are you doing on your knees? What are you doing flat on your face? This ain't a time for prayer. Find the one that's doing that and you get them to expose this because we need to get to Canaan. We need to get to the promise. We need to keep moving here. I'm not getting stuck at I. I, 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 right? I'm I'm not getting stuck there because at I, all you got is aching and aching means trouble in the Hebrew. 
So is there a wedge in your life? Something stopping you? Check yourself. I mean, check yourself. I mean, check your seat right now. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me place some under your seats. Check yourself. Is there a wedge of pride in the house? Is there a wedge of guilt? Check yourself. Is there a wedge under your seat? It it might be there, you know. Hey, maybe it's missing and you're just in denial and you need to come down here anyway because you know it does exist. I have a spare if anyone needs one. Is there a wedge? Is there something holding your walk back? Your marriage ain't right. Your life ain't right. You're always jealous about other people. Why do they make so much money? I don't believe they make so much money. How can they do that, you know? How come they're blessed? How come their kids are smarter than mine, you know? Come on now, you follow me? How many of you? How many of you didn't have a wedge, but you know it's in your heart? I just didn't catch you because I'm not a psychic. Come on up. I'm just trying to be honest, man. If y'all can't keep it real, okay, fine. There's five of us up here that got issues. Hallelujah. Save me a space. Somebody say amen. Maybe you hid it in your tent. And listen, if you did have a wedge, I'd bring it up here and leave it at the altar. Because it's been stopping you long enough. Sometimes that's what we do is that we leave our wedge at home. Probably we need to be bringing all this garbage to church and throw it away. Mm. Father in heaven, I come before you, Lord. Today, this is a hard message to preach. It, It applies to me, things in my life that hold me back from being everything I could be in you. And also in the members of this body. In Achan, it was his family. It just wasn't Achan. Everybody in his family knew what was going on. You know how families are. They know where we're really at. And they knew something was going on. And yet, we did not go to them. The whole family suffered. All the people. In the church, the same way. I just want to commend all of you for being here. Because it's in coming forward that we say, man, I want to get my heart right, man. I don't need things slowing me down anymore. I want to be flowing in the spirit. I want to be flowing in the presence of God. I want to pray for people. I want to expect God to do great things. I want to hope great things. But I can't do that if I've always got this guilt in my heart from these little secret sins that have been hidden in my temple. Underground, deep inside. So right now, Father, we pray that you begin to clear our hearts. Right now, listen to me. Say, say your own personal prayer. Just say, Father, you know the wedge in my life. You know, I'm jealous about somebody. I'm angry. I'm bitter. Something from my past. Somebody hurt me, and I'm carrying that around. I don't trust people anymore. Whatever it is. And if you want to, keep that little wedge, put a hole in and put a ring on it, and hang it on your refrigerator, in your car somewhere, on the button to your car radio, something like that. Just keep it. But let it remind you, don't let anything stop my walk. Come on now. Anybody follow me here? Don't let nothing stop your wonderful walk in the Lord. God didn't set you free from all those addictions and everything just to have you come here and sit in these pews. God wants you to do great things with your life. Be a great father. Be a great mother. Be a great parent. A great husband. A great wife. God wants you to do some great things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. He said, Lord, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent. Folks, what's hidden underground in your heart? Come on, get that wedge of gold out of there. Lord, pray.